So we took a little bit of everyone's combination of experiences and combined it and, uh, you know, documented this so you can see some of our, our activities and, and maybe learn from that or, you know, maybe resonates with you or uh, validate some of the things that you've been involved with. Welcome to CMC Live. This is the show where we discuss CMC regulations and guidances simplified through real life experiences and risk based advice. Each episode, we speak with subject matter experts as well as other leading industry authorities. With your host, Ed Narkey. Okay, so welcome to CMC Live introduction here. We have Brian, Leo, and Miranda. It's been a wonderful, happy year. We're uh, ending the year here on a high note with the Best of Show. We'll have a lot of new stuff in the future, and we'll talk about that at the end. So we we started off this year with this this podcast, CMC Live. You know, simplifying, examining everything out there that involves CMC and regulatory and quality assurance. We're hoping that you know it's not intended to be a prescriptive advice. That's maybe why you might call us and engage. But uh, it's a bit of an interpretation of what's right for you. Every program is different. Every Every budget's different, you know, resources are different. So every program needs a, a bit of a specific plan. However, a lot of the f- underlying uh, issues and concerns out there and, you know, things, questions that have been around for 20 years are, are the same. So we took a little bit of everyone's combination of experiences and combined it and, uh, you know, documented this so you can see some of our, our activities and, and maybe learn from that or, you know, maybe resonates with you or uh, validate some of the things that you've been involved with. So the beginning uh, sort of, of mid, mid-year this year, we we had Jim Mensel, Dr. Jim Mensel on the uh, podcast. He brings a lot of experiences with our API world. Jim talked about expedited drug development. It's it's a hot topic for a number of years. It involves breakthrough designation, orphan products, any kind of accelerated approval pathways. There's a lot of misconceptions about what you can get away with what, you know, what wouldn't be required based on that. We gave some insight on, um, you know, some of the experiences that we have with the agencies, you know, discussing certain topics with them. Episode number one, Jim Mensal. When you are in a program that gets expedited, okay, the intention is for the program to move quickly. And there are several ways in which it can move quickly, but almost all of them lead to a very shortened time frame for CMC. So what it gets you is the FDA is aware that there is stress on CMC. Brian, any anything that you learned from that episode, you know, as far as expedited drug development, maybe having some exposure yourself with some of the programs? Yeah, I think it was it was one getting Jim's perspective on that. I mean, I, I know in terms of DSI, he does a lot of work with with expedited drug development programs, but it seemed to match some of the the things that were said on the regulatory side, where there's certain assumptions that that sometimes companies will make that is going to be accepted by the FDA because it's under the guise of expedited drug development. But to Jim's point, there are certain steps you simply can't overlook, you know, impurities, drug development, all of those things that go into a typical filing, they still need to be gone through. They still need to tell that story. And a lot of times, at least what Jim was trying to say there is that there is an understanding that CMC is under a great deal of pressure because now you're skipping large portions of time where a lot of that development and that a lot of that characterization would have taken place. So you still need to tell that story with data. So I thought that was really insightful. And it was nice to see that his drug substance experience agrees with my drug product and certainly the regulatory team saying the same thing. I thought that was very helpful. Yeah, that was really well put. And and Miranda, you agree. I think two things I remember vividly from actually episode one and episode number two, uh, where we talked a bit about starting materials and ICH requirements. One of them was the reference that Jim made to the playbook, you know, having, if you have a playbook, you know, you, you really have a script. We talked about football and the analogy there and, and, and how that works. So discussing things and having that playbook, you know, that plan in place um, a lot better going into any type of accelerated program than, than just winging it based on what, you know, the outcome or what the, uh, the decision needs to be that day. The other thing I remember about that was uh, that his dog Duke joined us, which was a very special treat there. So and it was the first yogi it was the first yogi berra quote that we had had i think that's what he ended with that oh yes yes we we will be doing the uh the quote the quote uh, episode maybe that's uh next next year though you know i see this as like being an advanced scout watching the, watching another team play ball you know if you could stand at the field and watch how they approach the way they do things you're prepared when you face that team yourself and i think that if you can approach the fda and say look here's what we have based upon the guidance. What do you think? 
I think you're better off than waiting until you face them down when you have to do it because you've run out of time and you really aren't prepared. We also had Dave Adams on the podcast, uh, episode number eight, later in the season. I had a pleasure to work with Dave over the years at uh, a CMO, learned a bit of process chemistry, but you know, Dave's been a lifer in the, uh, the manufacturing realm. We called the episode number eight, Trust the Process. Here's a sample. If you understand how the equipment and the processes are going to work in a plant up front, you can make much better progress putting something into production than you can by just taking a laboratory procedure and introducing it to a plant. Okay, that was a high level snippet. We don't want to get too far. You must listen to episode eight. But Brian, thoughts? Absolutely. One of the things that resonated with me on that particular podcast was how Dave took a step back and he said, you really can't underestimate the importance of the skilled technicians that actually run the process. And oftentimes the disconnect between the scientists that develop the process, but then there's the technicians that have to actually implement it on the shop floor. And having their input and expertise kind of infused at an early phase really ensures success on the back end. I thought that was really important that, that I think Dave brought a real practical approach to scale up of a process and getting it to the manufacturing floor. I think that was really important for me. I agree. I agree. This episode, we were building on the process here and uh, besides trusting it, but we also had a discussion with Dan Turok, who's a longtime API drug substance slash everything to everyone. Same thing. Dan worked with Dave. You know, we talked about the white coat effect and how it's real. It's we talked about process champions. We talked about, you know, oversight and responsibilities and accountability. You know, one of the things I remember well is, you know, we had large pharma customers when we worked at CMOs and they had their team, they had a folks come in, look after the you know, they basically rented our facilities. We had the inherent, you know, equipment knowledge and some of those understandings, but you know, they actually uh, were responsible for some of the decisions based on some where they wanted to be with their business model. So we help folks every day, you know, that aren't used to dealing with the CMO. Um, the CMO is not used to dealing with a business model, you know, exit strategy. They're making something to a certificate of analysis and trying to get it out the door. They're doing as much work as they're getting paid for literally to find out, you know, the ins and outs of the process. And that varies based on budget. So let's go to Dan and visit where we were at. Probably the, the most touching was I spent a lot of time on an API facility on the East Coast. And on the last day when I was finally walking out, their, their process chemist said, you know, I want to thank you. You're the first person in plant who's ever actually helped me. Okay. And that sort of sums up Dan's personality. I remember a long time ago, what he liked about process chemistry. And he said he always likes to, to fix things. He was an avid biker and he used to put bikes together. So I think the same applies, but that's sort of the background, uh, Brian. I mean, that's a lot of what we do is act on behalf and, you know, be, basically become representatives of uh, small companies to make sure that their, uh, the outlook there is, is, is good. There's no bottlenecks and, you know, the, everything, there's no surprises. So yeah, I, I think Dan personifies that that person in plant. And one of the things that he said in that particular podcast was, and you heard it in that snippet where they, they actually thanked him for his presence. You know, it's really that personality. It's that disarming nature that, that really makes you part of the team making the batch, whether you're the person in plant observer or you're the technicians actually making the batch itself. And having that trust and that understanding, once you establish that, I think what Dan was saying is that that communication line is always open. And you're just looked at as another member of the team. You're willing to be there at the door at 3 a.m. when the process starts. And people see that and they identify with it. And, and it really makes for the most effective use of your time when you're in the plant overseeing a process. That was a good podcast. I enjoyed that one. Yeah. One of the things that I still remember, like with Jim's playbook with Dan was about the respect that he gives to CMOs. Like you're not in there to show them how it works or show them how they should do it. You know, you're a partner with them. You know, you're the interface uh, between the customer and what they do. That that's their profession. That's their business model. So, I think Dan has a good persona. I think all of our API folks. But he, you know, in episode number uh, number ten, Dan really nailed it. And, and if you listen to a couple of the clips on how he operates, you know, puts the, the CMO management team at ease. I think it really is a good bridge, you know, and, and things are, are usually productive when that happens. Well, actually, if you think about it, though, Miranda, we do have people that ask about person and plant. And, you know, they do say now it's unfortunate with COVID because we've had people insist on it and we've had to say no, but, but the reality is that they still need that person in plant. So I think, 
you know, what Dan brings to the table, I think is something that a lot of clients look for, because I think, as you know, some of these clients don't have that infrastructure and they just blindly trust the CMO and, and sometimes not always to, to the right result. Yeah, so Dan was a great uh, great guest this this uh, season. We also had Rick Offerman on episode 14, and we talked about why now is the most important time for selecting a CMO that has many meanings clip. A lot of CMOs are now going to a one-stop shop type model. So basically, they, they'll say, yeah, we can take you all the way from gram quantities right through commercial. We can do your API and your drug substance. But there are still a lot of uh, smaller shops out there that are med chem shops. You know, they can do the small scale preclinical work. They can make you a few grams of everything. Maybe they can scale up the, the drug that you want or the API that you want to a kilo. But really, you know, they're working in a small shop. That, that's, that's their business model. And they'll take you up to maybe a phase one. Uh, maybe they'll do some tox work. And then they say, we're done. We, we're, we're not going to change our entire business model to, uh, you know, to make commercial or, or late phase material. So another uh, really good podcast. I I had three different things I thought about after hearing that the uh, that that last clip versus the original when I heard it. I mean, one of the things that jumped out is you know when you make a decision on your supply chain, you got to think about where you want to be, right? You, as we understood and find out, you know, moving from facility to facility, especially an external facility, new facility, quite expensive and it's a it's kind of a headache. So part of that I got out of that was you know kind of think about the big picture plan. And uh, where you want to, you know, your exit strategy, if you're going to divest your program or sell your product, a lot different decision making um, than, you know, if you're going to take it through and commercialize it, maybe find another supplier. So I think one of the biggest things for me, and, and I've seen it on the drug product side, and, and, and I know Rick speaks for drug substance and drug product, is the importance of knowing the CMO that you actually partner with. And, and when they say that they can handle everything from early phase uh, on through late stage phase and ultimately commercial, it would be really important to have that that vendor cite examples of that, some successful examples of that. Because, you know, those small shops that Rick references, there is absolutely a place for that. Um, it all depends, like you said, it all depends on knowing your own program and what is important. If that program is going to stay with your company all the way through your commercial filing, then then fine. Maybe it does make sense to partner with one group. But if it's not the case, you might want to try to find a place that's that's more suited to your need at that time. And I, I think that that whole podcast with Rick, I think, was was really relevant for me. A nice segue on my screen here, as I see it, selecting a CMO now, you know, now's the time, et cetera. I'll jump ahead a little bit. Uh, we had uh, Les Mintzmeyer on the podcast as well, episode seven, earlier in the season, and none of these were related. I'm just trying to tie some of this together, but I th think I find it interesting now. He did speak about that in a way as well, mainly on the drug product side. He Les also gave us a couple examples and, and gave us his thoughts on um, vendor selection process. Um, you know, how many, how many CMOs to pursue and what to look for, and then maybe a little bit on how to make a decision based on that. So we could play a clip from Les tell you what, the money they'll spend on consultants early on is a drop in the bucket compared to change orders and change of scope and misunderstandings that occur later on. Yeah. And let's also talked about the, a little bit on, you know, maybe using consultants there. And that's kind of the game that we're in here, you know, obviously to, to make a business out of it, but, you know, to actually apply what we've been doing. I mean, most everyone here at DSI is still doing what they've been doing more or less, you know, we're, we've been virtual for 10 years plus two. So uh, even though a lot of stuff changed last year, not a lot has changed. Obviously things evolve technology and some of the ways we interact, but so that was a, that was an interesting um, discussion with Les. I do remember a few things about, you know, the vendor selection process. And I think you, Brian had a nice, you know, thoughts. Everyone has a little bit of different opinion on it, but you know, multiple um, proposals and you have to kind of look at a lot of the stuff internally as well, how you can manage that. The biggest, best may not be the best for everyone, right? The, the smallest may be cheaper. It might be a little bit more easy to work with and manage, but you know, you might come into a, a later stage, later phase development area where that vendor may not be appropriate for you. And we just mentioned that, you know, to leave a facility and, and find something else, if it's a scale thing or just a dealing with a CMO thing, it's costly. And, you know, it's something that you don't want to get involved with later on if you don't have to. Yeah. And I think companies are actually realizing that earlier on. We've had a lot more requests come in about CMO selections or, you know, at least reviewing the RFP and comparing 
apples to apples since they're all different. So I think people are now realizing that they do need to take a lot of different factors in consideration when selecting their CMO, and they might need that assistance from experts like us. Yeah, and it's frustrating. I think if you if you listen to that snippet from from Les, it's kind of where he makes that that statement about the money you're spending on consultants today pales in comparison to the potential mistakes you can make if if you make the wrong choice. And I think, you know, Ed, to your point about having that experience coming on board as part of your selection process is essential. And I know when Miranda and I are talking to to potential clients, we highlight the fact that we've done this before, that it's not something that we're just going to look at that lowest cost or that quickest lead time. All these factors have to be considered when you make this choice. And I think Les did a really nice job of, of explaining some of the potential pitfalls if you don't do that proper due diligence up front. Right. And Les, unfortunately, the audience wouldn't be able to, won't be able to see the background there, but he had the best artwork of anybody in the backgrounds. Best studio, apparently. I don't know. I get a lot of compliments about my aquarium. Okay. Now I have a tree to compliment it. I do see some seasonal decoration that very, very nice, actually very nice. So we we can kind of go back and the last piece of the drug substance, I kind of think it's kind of fitting when we talked about selecting the right vendor for the active costs that involve with it, the management, where they're located. We did talk amongst all these last folks and, you know, there's snippets in there about some of the cultural differences dealing with offshore, you know, seasonality. Sometimes there's uh, seasons that, you know, uh, folks are not maybe manufacturing as much, et cetera. I'll leave it at that. But to time it out, you know, Dave Blasengame joined us episode 15, one of our more recent ones. And Dave's on the West Coast and Dave has just a ton of experience with Asia and outsourcing Asia and has been there and, you know, basically knows the climate, has seen a lot of the transition in the last 15 years, you know, first to outsource there and now maybe to outsource back. So how far can it go was the title. You know, there's things that we learn, there's things that we have basically accepted, and there's things that are changing based on, you know, just 2020 and some of the things there. I think it's a natural go-to for early projects to make GLP material, maybe some early phase one material. For all the obvious reasons. I think China in particular is known for being very quick at being able to produce that kind of material and also significantly cheaper most of the time compared to maybe U.S. counterparts or European counterparts. So I think it's kind of a natural go-to for the first step, first stages of uh, any clinical program. I found that podcast very interesting because, you know, there's the cliche that's associated with manufacturing in China and all the pitfalls, but but Dave went the other route and he he offered some of the advantages and and not just in cost. There's so much more than just cost. And he talked about the evolution of manufacturing in China. And I think the one thing that really stood out for me, Ed, in that podcast is when he talked about their recruiting practice and when when they're graduating thousands of PhDs each year and how literally industry just stops and it opens its doors to heavily and aggressively recruit the best talent into their companies. And I think he he provided a really interesting perspective having spent so much time in China himself and it was it was firsthand experience even down to the food you know I I really found that that podcast to be enjoyable yeah Dave did bring up a good thing, and I think that resonated. Dan and I talked about this. We grew up in U.S. manufacturing when there was 10 or 15 CMOs making APIs in the U.S., and now we're down to five. And, you know, there's not a lot of training going on. Folks that come out of the school, you know, and work in a facility, a lot of it's virtual. Essentially, you're just managing an offshore. You don't get the sense and feel. So, you know, it could be interesting that the folks that support API process in 15 years as as Dave Belazengame mentioned, one of the things I think I mentioned in there wasn't the one, but you know, Chinese proverb, tell me, I forget, show me, I remember, involve me, I understand. So it's part of that you know, experience basically and being able to translate that into decision-making for the biotech community. So, so yeah, and we also had a uh, episode number 17 where we had a panel of our drug substance experts touching on all the topics that we just talked about plus more. So Brian, you can give a little bit of a preview on that, some of those topics. Yeah, you know, it, it's funny, that panel discussion was really interesting. And one of the things that came from that is when when all of these individuals with all of this years of experience and diverse experience started to talk, they all came to the same conclusion that while uh, domestic manufacturing is trying to catch up in terms of competing with what's being done in, in Asia and, and certainly in Western Europe, there is a gap. There's an experience gap that's been left in the wake of moving all this, this work out there. And, and so it's trying to get that next generation of, 
of qualified scientists and technicians to work at the sites that are being started up. And it's not just as simple as flicking a switch. And I, to hear them all talk about that and with great admiration, some of the sites abroad that they've gone and visited and how they all seem to share the same opinion that, that it's more than just you know, the turning of a switch and saying manufacturing moves home at this point. It's, there's a lot of infrastructure that needs to be created and cultivated. I thought that was important. This group that we have, James Mensel and Dave Adams, Dan Torok, Rick and Dave, these are some of the greatest. This is a dream team uh, as far as like, you know, if you're relating it to history, dream team for API with their collective actual manufacturing on-site experience originally and then continuing that on, some of the travels, you know, really having complete control and understanding of the landscape of the API world and how that's developed and how that evolves and what that would look like. So, you know, I encourage anyone to check out that panel episode number 17, but also go back to the individual discussions, you know, with Dave and James and Dan, those things like that. There's a lot of just personal introspective. So, so we also had a uh, Kyriakos Michalaris. We had a slight, uh, technical problem on this one. So we had to go back and revisit it. But I think the second one was better than the first. We talked about living development reports. We talked originally again about the, you know, strategy and, and getting a blueprint in place and, and basically being able to find out where you want to go on the drug product side. So I learned a little bit more about that area versus the API stuff because I've heard Dave and Jim and you grew up in the drug product world, uh, Brian. And you I think you asked a few good questions. So let's listen to a clip from from Kyriakos. A good reviewer would do that, yes. I mean, some reviewers, are, it seems, can be primarily just, you know, box checking. You know, have take less of a holistic um, risk-based approach, which is kind of, the, has, has been the trend for some time now. I try to focus on, you know, what is actually important for this particular product and has that been uh, explored appropriately? I know a few, a few of our uh, customers and folks, partners that we worked with, we, you know, it kind of reminded me of QBD, quality by design, and, you know, do we do that and versus quality by chance? And, you know, I think that was a, a good podcast to talk about, you know, why quality by chance QBC is not, you know, a good option. You know, we advise everyone based on, you know, approvability and, and you know, the, the sniff test, essentially, if you can get an approval. And there's always ways to generate more information if you want to do different things. But I think, you know, Q summarized that and talked about the importance of having a partner at the FDA, having them on at the, at the table with you, and also how you document some of that things in development reports. So Brian, any additional thoughts on? Yeah, you know, when he said that, it kind of, it, and you know, we've worked with many clients over the years and and many different opinions on, on relevant sections as we support filings and things like that. But he said something in that clip that was really important. A lot of times our clients will come back and say, well, you know, this is what we expect the FDA to look for. This is what a typical review is, but it's not quite so simple. When Kyriakos mentioned, he looks at the development history as, are we representing the process? Is there a particular area of concern? And have we explored it enough? And is it captured? in our summary? Is it captured with supporting data? Not so much we're trying to anticipate what they're going to look at because that's what they always look at, which sometimes that does happen. But if you know that you have now properly identified and characterized the, the development history of your product and its, its pitfalls, its areas of concern, and you've explored those, it really makes for a much more robust filing that stands up to scrutiny. And I thought when he said that, it was really important. Don't look at it as though you just have to capture it just because. Does it make sense to your product to capture this or should you do more? I thought that was that was pretty insightful. And guess what? This one was brought to you by the year 2020. Episode number four, podcast episode number four, that is. Uh, we, we spoke with Bettina Kaplan, who is one of our highly uh, trained and experienced QA uh, folks here at DSI. And Bettina talked about quality assurance. Obviously, that's her game. Auditing in the times of uh, COVID and virtual touring, virtual auditing. It's something that I'm sure a lot of folks are starting to hear about, but we've actually had some experiences with it now. So maybe we can get a bit of a clip and then kind of recap some of what Bettina talked about. So if you have to cover manufacturing, analytical, and all the quality systems in one day to do a thorough audit, there's no way you could do it with one person. Brian, you have, you've lived a little bit of the virtual and so have you, Miranda. Maybe you guys want to talk amongst yourselves here a little bit and some of your feelings and how you felt things have gone. And Sure. You know, Miranda, we, we have gone back and forth with 
prospective clients on exactly how many people does it take to do this for how many days. And I think each case is different. I don't think it's necessarily a, a, a rubber stamp. It requires this for this. We, we had one group that's looking at us to do uh, qualification audits, uh, to do them virtually. And we had to develop an internal virtual audit model uh, based on client feedback, based on compliant requirements and all those things and put that together. But then you have to look at it in terms of what team is best suited for that audit. And, and as Bettina mentioned, if it's an analytical, let's say you're doing the release testing and the in-processing there, you're going to want scrutiny on the labs as you look at the quality systems, as you look at the production floor. And that's why we typically recommend a team. Uh, and I know it seems some people look at it just as, as the sheer number of hours, but if you are qualifying that vendor and you're about to make a sizable investment in time and resources into that vendor, you're going to want to make sure that that audit really gets you the, the best bang for your buck. You know, we've had these conversations before, don't you think? Yeah, it's been going back and forth with a few different prospects and clients about that, but I think they've been really accepting of the process and probably hadn't thought about it in that manner. So it's been really good to walk them through it, talk them through it. So they understand how we do things. It's not just one-sided. It has expert advice uh, along with the QA. Yeah. And I think the thing that, that makes that, that podcast good for me was virtual audit is not the same as a paper audit. It's not the same as just, it has to be more because oftentimes paper audits just aren't applicable to what you're trying to do. They're not. If you're qualifying a vendor, a paper audit is not sufficient. Um, you're trying to replace that experience of being on the floor, looking at the finishes, looking at how logbooks are are stored, looking at the condition of the gowning suites and the airlocks and all of that. You can you can look at that from from drawings, but when you have video access and actually can see the rooms, most of the rooms, you may not get all of them, but I think that's really what sets it apart from say a paper audit. I think Bettina speaks. You know, loads of experience in, in the audit world. Um, she was instrumental in developing our protocol that we use within DSI. And just hearing her speak to the different challenges with audits and how she's overcome them, I thought was really, really helpful. Great recap, Brian. So, so go back and, you know, check out uh, podcast number four. You know, we talked about GMP audit alternatives during the, during the pandemic, requesting, preparing, responding to anything, you know, alternatives, you talked about paper audits, where things are going, you know, maybe how this has helped industry uh, in the quality aspect. So podcast number six, we had Coleman Byrne uh, join us talking about analytical method developments. And again, one of the Mount Rushmore fellows out there as far as analytical concerns are. Coleman has a really unique uh, perspective. He taught us how he actually got involved with analytical to start, which I always wanted to ask him, but never did until he joined us on the podcast. So let's hear a little bit from Coleman. It is typically less expensive to develop a solid test method than it is to develop a drug substance manufacturing process or to go through and manufacture bunches of batches of drug products. So, yeah, we, we spoke with Coleman, you know, I mean, he, he just brought so much great insight. You know, he's been doing this with us for 15 years and prior to that for about 20. And, you know, he really has honed in, in, in the game and analytical. He talked to us about the importance of when to qualify a method, why, how to bridge that between the substance and the product, you know, how to tie that to, you know, monitoring the impurity profile and some of that profiling that you do, you know, building some of the methods that you can be, that can be used alternatively across any other areas, you know, if there's different work that has to be done, characterization work, for example. Brian, any thoughts on, you know, you get to work with Coleman frequently. There's a certain things that, did you, did you pick up anything from that discussion? Yeah, you know, I really did. Thanks. I a lot of times will, you know, people will ask, do you have testing labs? And the answer is no, we don't have testing labs. But well, when how can your consultant help us if you don't have testing labs? And I think when you hear uh, Coleman's podcast, you'll hear him say things like he understands and has been there when it talks about all the the, the challenges that that testing lab is 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 going through. And he can help them find creative solutions to move forward. And oftentimes more than the client can, because they may not have the same experiences or breadth of experiences that, that he has. And when you listen to his podcast, you'll hear him talk about the fact that, that, that again, much like you've heard in the past in this podcast, 
it really comes down to trust. And once that lab understands that the person on the other end of that phone has been there and done that and seen those challenges, uh, then they're more accepting and willing to share when mistakes are made or, or areas to improve. And then you've got the relationship to take it forward. And I think the one thing that, that also resonates in that podcast from Coleman is, is the fact that compromise has to be part of the vernacular. You have to find a means to reach an agreement with your testing lab and still meet the compliance requirement and be somewhat bending at times in order to find that path forward. And I think that comes through in, in Coleman's podcast. Yeah, and Coleman's been doing this, so he obviously has um, some experiences with other areas, regulatory and quality. So he's able to pull it together. I mean, his great technical ability. So putting that in conjunction with his knowledge of, you know, analytical what goes into submissions, he supports not only just initial filings, but he he's a person, and everyone should have someone like this that can come in and become a technical defense of a submission, you know, some of that information around methods, why certain things are done. It's not clear. Sometimes it's just a method, right? Coleman, definitely uh, were a podcast worth re-listening to. This is one you shouldn't miss, podcast episode number six, I believe. Before we get into the regulatory, we had a special external guest, uh, Headley Rees, who talked a bit about supply chain. I think we were going to have this on the, the back end of this wrap up, but, you know, tying it together with the supply chain and how to create a value chain. I mean, it's a very also critical uh, piece to your drug development profile. I think for, at least in my experiences, maybe yourself, Brian, as well, and Miranda, you know, we talked about analytical and regulatory submissions and quality assurance audits for, you know, since we've been doing this, this has been a year of supply chain, whole different element out there that I think that has had increased focus based on the conditions and travel restrictions and those things like that. So maybe let's listen to a bit of the Intro episode number 12, Headley Rees from the UK, someone I've known for a long time. I mean, I talk to Excipient suppliers sometimes and they say, you know, the guys who are developing that product, they they really didn't consult us. They did, really didn't try and understand what's going to work, what isn't going to work. And the main point between, us, between strategic supply chain management is you actually engage with the end user of your product the same way as Applewood or, you know, any company who really builds value in, into their product. That was a nice external podcast discussion. Um, there was a bit of discussion on how Big Pharma does things a bit differently. And, you know, that's that's certainly a, a thing you have to consider um, working with small biotechs that maybe are acquired by Big Pharma. There's an integration process. We hope that in 2021, we have a few more of our supply chain experts on who are pretty great. I guess in the meantime, maybe Brian, you, you want to do a summary of our supply chain 2020. I think what we've come to realize, and Miranda and I've been on the phone a couple of times with prospective clients and actually current clients, where supply chain was just another part of their main job. And, and it really for these, these early phase clinicals where you're enrolling studies left and right, and you, you're dealing with label packaging centers and, and distribution centers and how to accommodate them, um, how to relate to um, drug supply, and, and even something as simple as putting together a dashboard that management can understand. We, we've come to realize in this last year that, that a lot of it is really a bit of an afterthought until it reaches critical mass. So from that, we decided internally here is to really develop a supply chain resource for clients. It started off as a supply chain resource for our current clients, but then we realized early on that it's very appealing to any client at that point. So we, we're probably halfway into developing and refining that, that service, but of the folks that we have internally, We've got some commercial supply chain and we've got uh, the majority is clinical supply chain experience where having that knack and that knowledge of some of the main sites and, and some of the nuances that get handed down by clinical operations people and the challenges. And I think that's to what Hadley uh, spoke of where he said it's having an understanding of the entire supply chain, that this all has to logistically work. You know, just because it's in the protocol, there still has to work. And having that understanding has really been the catalyst for why we wanted to develop a, a supply chain service. 
So go back and check out Headley's podcast. Also a shameless plug. He has a pretty interesting book called Taming the Big Pharma Monster by Speaking Truth to Power. So I think anyone that worked at Big Pharma and also Small Pharma, this will resonate. So we talked a bit about, you know, actually talked a little, a lot about the drug substance side. We have some guests this year. We talked a bit about the drug product areas. We we did t- cover quality assurance. A lot of these topics we'll be revisiting in next season. One of the things I wanted to tie it together at the end is our experiences with regulatory. Again, we have a pretty good group of folks there that have uh, collectively experienced, you know, biologics and small molecules and very hairy situations. We talked with them about, you know, submissions, not just writing the submissions, but, you know, decisions on how to generate the data that goes into submissions, when to generate that data. And these could be, there's a variety of different things you can do at there. Uh, talking about strategy and submissions, again, like I said in the beginning, every program is kind of unique. So like I mentioned in the podcast, if I recall, we were, we're the industry version of the investigative reporter, you know, the regulatory folks on the side. You know, we go out there and we're talking to the agencies. We're talking to our data people. We're talking to our technical functional people here who understand the science part. And then also the people who make, you know, make the make the materials um, who are technical as well. So what I mentioned there, and this has always been my training from original, you know, marketing application, whether it's an IND or an NDA or BLA or anything, drug master file, it's a way of telling us something, telling the agency something basically, right? So the, the data is trying to tell a story. It's always trying to tell a story. And anyone who is into literature reading and stuff, you know, you know, a good book between a bad book, right? Some of them, some of us like the books on tape, but that's not a, an option yet for the marketing application. So our job is as regulatory reviewers, strategists, authors, CMC experts, what you will. And I think all our technical people now are merged into that. Whatever we want our job to be, you know, we have to decipher what that data is saying. So, you know, to become a good author, you know, you really have to be able to streamline messaging. You know, you have to be able to tie some of the holes, gaps together. Marketing app application speaks a language. There's a language that that's required, you know, per the regulations in the common technical document. You know, we, we do here, and I think we'll we'll get to some of these episodes here, I can highlight some, you know, we we're able to interpret that language and what the data is saying. Sometimes it could be standoffish. We don't have all the data. So we have to create a, a legitimate story, you know, and sometimes that involves getting down to the FDA or over to Europe, whether it's on the phone, in person, however it happens in the future, you know, discuss and also share again, bringing the FDA, the EMA, any other body to the table, you know, to, to help them help develop this drug, help them understand and get to know and be feel comfortable with that. So we wanted to maybe start this at this season, January, we deal with a lot of early stage companies. We've in the past attended JP Morgan Healthcare and Biotech Conference on the West Coast. And it's a really interesting dynamic out there. Like I mentioned to Brian, you before Miranda, you know, it reminds me of Boston, maybe 10, 10 years ago, a few large companies, very established, you know, very successful companies with that laid a model out. And um, subsequently, I think in myself, my experiences last seven years going there at that time of year, you know, you're seeing a lot of new companies, a lot of newer one product in development. Again, same issues that you, we saw on the East Coast. Not having a lot of experience, you know, what do you do? How much do you spend? Where do you put your efforts in? Episode number three, we had Judy Magruder on the podcast, which I really enjoyed Judy. I've met her out there seven years straight now. You know, she talked a bit about effective strategies for early stage drug development. Let's have a listen. The horses are great. The horses are terrific. It, you know, I tell people it's like the cheapest therapist you'll ever have because when you, you get on that horse, everything else goes out of your head. You know, it's, you know, when people talk about focus and about, you know, living in the moment, you better live in the moment or it's not very safe. And Judy also has horses, so that's why that conversation piece came up. There's a backstory to that, but you know, I'll just I'll just say a little bit about it. Judy has a little bit of experience with CMC, but unlike a lot of our folks, she's not a deep technical person enough to know and make decisions. Her background, I think, is you know really just facilitating the right discussions with early stage companies to let them know what's important, um, certain things that you just can't miss, right? And I think that she. She does a really good job with that effectively. You know, it's you, you may not need a consultant necessarily 40 hours a week when you're just heading into a phase one, especially on CMC, but you'll need somebody. You'll need somebody to, you know, kind of lay out again, like a pathway. And I think as, as you start getting involved with selecting vendors and maybe having a quick FDA meeting for an apprentice, you know, you're going to have experiences where you're going to want to ask the right question. So I, I thought that was a good one. I think everyone needs to be designated with a consulting expert not to get started, someone that's legitimate and has practical experiences. Obviously, no one's going to spend a ton of money or resources early on in development. You know, they want to get started. They want to have a proof of concept. They want to get somewhere 
where ultimately, let's admit it, they're, you know, their, their value or their asset has a value. So they're either going to get more funding or they're going to get partnership or, you know, they'll, they'll somehow move forward with some partnership, et cetera, um, either license the product out. So I think Judy did a really nice job of that. Did you guys recall anything from Judy on that? Yeah, I did uh, recall her, I think, big picture first uh, way of thinking. She supports companies and thinking about the big picture rather than just in, in the time frame or the mind that they're in right now, because they want to get to a point, right? Well, it was a really good point because she said it was really understanding the end goal, right? Which was whether that that goal is to move on with an investor relationship and take the product so far, or it's ultimately a filing. It was, a lot of this is in the preclinical space, obviously, but but what we found in, in meeting with potential clients is they're really just looking for a sounding board for their strategy. Judy's experience, Ed, as you'd mentioned, I mean, it's it's extensive. They really need that affirmation that the pl- the path they're on is the most expeditious way to get to where they want to be. And that's, th- I think that's the experience that Judy brought to bear is that, that holistic approach to, a, to a, a client's program. Think big picture first, and then all the the minutia and the smaller, what I call, you know, the micro plans come later. And I think when companies take the time to do that up front and build a registration strategy, you know, what does the product need to look like when it hits the market? All the plans underneath become that much more valuable and and realistic. Yeah, that was Judy Magruder, podcast episode number three. Very good for early stage companies. Moving back into the regulatory realm, one of our long-term consultants here, Dr. Catherine Bernard, Many, many, many years of experience. We talked to Catherine in podcast episode number five. I remember this one. Catherine spoke about pharmaceutical regulations and CMC, and that sounds very broad. However, you know, that's the episode I think she got down into some of the really specific minutia too. So let's let's hear a clip from Catherine, episode number five. And that's where the interaction with the FDA is critical. So the sooner the better. You need to be upfront when you go to those meetings with the FDA. However, you don't ask a question for which you don't want to hear the answer. Yeah, this goes a little bit back into, you know, basically being the uh, investigative reporter. You know, you have to get the facts and put them together. And, you know, some of the questions that you ask should, all of the questions you should ask, you should have some, there should be an outcome expected. So not to do additional work, but, you know, to maybe make a decision. And if you feel that you're going to have, you know, kickback or pushback based on, you know, you're not just, you're not, you're not doing what's expected. You better have a good uh, story for that, or at least negotiation tactic, because um, you know the FDA will call you out on it. So, any any additional things with Catherine, we can talk in many directions. With uh... to me, it was her practical experience. When I mean wh- that that little clip alone speaks to her practical, hands-on experience. It's it's make sure you're transparent, make sure that you're asking questions that you want to know the answer to. And I think one of the things that we always say is that that the consultant that works on that filing really is there for the, the entire life cycle of, the, of that submission, whether it's information requests that come or it's the, the meeting request, the briefing book, really having that same consistent person who is hearing your story and then can also provide you seasoned experience to give you the best chance of approval with the FDA. And I think that podcast, you can really hear that in what she says. It, it comes from experience, not reading it simply out of the regulations. Right. And Catherine has tremendous experience with interactions with the agency. So again, you know, it's come a second hand to her. So now we'll get to the, you know, kind of closing up the uh, summary of 2020 here. I always wanted my own regulatory show. Obviously, I got started back in February of this year with a goal to do a podcast and, you know, not knowing exactly what that meant uh, or who was going to help. Kind of want to give a warm plug here and a thank you to you guys have you made it such a kind of interesting experience. You know, before we get into the final submission discussion here, you know, you can't just dive into this stuff. I think you guys brought a lot to the table here. So we also had a couple of internal discussions on podcast episode number nine, recipes to build towards your NDA, BLA, with Ed Narky, Brian, Leo, and Miranda Parascondola. I remember preparing for that, getting all my checklists out and all my stick jump jump drives and going back and seeing stuff. Doing this for 14 years, I remember collectively organizing all my help, my, my blueprints and stuff, and realizing like what a wonderful like a collection of uh, support that I have on my computers and stuff like that. And um, sharing that over the years with some of our individuals, I had some flashbacks too. I got excited a little bit too. So episode number nine, it was, I think it was me rambling about, you know, just everything that happens. And I think it was just 
brain dump. So let's let's listen to that. That was a good one if you're interested in that. It's hard to become an expert. There's no real training. There are courses and certifications and regulatory, but I think a lot of it is just experience. You know, it's 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 going into meetings with FDA when you don't have all the data. Yeah, I haven't said that before. <laughs> I'm like, I need a new uh, a new pitch or whatever. So that was a uh, you know again, Brian. You know, I don't know. I mean, I I remember when I met you originally, very hardcore drug product person heard your stories about being on the dock and the loading things. And I I sort of had like memories of manufacturing, but, you know, I left manufacturing in like 1999 and just had like an office job, let's just say some, and virtual for like 80% of that since then. You know, I'm I'm proud, you know, how much you've picked up on the regulatory space and just, you've also developed your own feelings and thinkings. And, you know, sometimes I don't agree with them. I'm like, you know, but then again, you know what? There, I think the regulatory thing is it's it's an, there's a range, right? You're either extreme this way or that way. I think you have a great balance. I think you're right in the middle, and you you know you pull things because you've seen things, and I I do the same. And kind of a testament. I think Miranda the same thing. I these are my two most proud, uh, to be honest, ones just because it's the most I knew about, maybe felt most comfortable talking about. Episode number thirteen. One of the the areas that's really essential when you're putting together your authoring team is to have somebody at the client that truly understands where the skeletons are, that truly understands and is forthright and saying, for example, listen, in development, we don't have the following items. They are planned, but we don't have them. Okay, we will look at that. We will rate that risk. If the risk is great, then we may advise you to wait until that data comes in. However, if it may not be, as long as you demonstrate the plan you have in place and you can speak to it, whether it's referencing the protocol or content of a protocol, you you may be able to work around that with the understanding you may get questions. But for us, it really is someone who understands their document library. Exactly. So you see how sensational that sounded, Miranda? I mean, I... don't get me wrong, Brian was a bright guy back in 2008, but now he is like polished. So again, Brian, you're, you know, th- those episodes, I think collectively, we just talked about some experiences, strategy decisions. You know, we talked about this submission authoring, there's different styles, there's different procedural stuff. Pat myself on the back and everyone here, you know, we've been involved with over 200 companies and had a lot of success with marketing applications, worked on products that are actually out there, you know, in, in, administered to patients. So I think at the end of the day, I remember my my kids asked me what I did when I was younger. They still do sometimes explain this, but I just said, you know, I help, I help people make medicines, you know, to help them and stuff like that. And I guess that always resonates. I heard my son one time say that, you know, my dad helps make medicines and stuff like that. So whether it's regulatory or quality or CMC, you know, we're all just normal people here, obviously, but, um, you know, we're kind of passionate about that. So anything else, Brian, you can share things that you learned. Miranda, same, same thing. We try to do an online internal EDU course, Ed University, by the way, that stands for. <laughs> <laughs> I have to make myself um, useful, right? Yeah. Come on. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's funny when, when so when I first started with DSI, like you said, it I came from a production background, and and filings were always a, a a big source of anxiety. And when you're in the production side, you only see it as there's only one way to do it, and that happens to be who's in charge dictating that that's the way it has to be done. And what I learned from you early on, a, a lot, believe me, a lot, um, was that that filings can be written based on a person's style because they're people. And when I first started talking to you about a range, like you you would look at a section and you would say, whoa, wait a minute, that's a lot of words, but they're not telling you anything. And that could have been written in in a fraction of the time. I had to learn that. I had to see that. And when you pointed out the fact that that no one submission is written the same way every time. And, And so now we've kind of rolled that into what we tell clients. You know, obviously it's heavily influenced by the client with the injected experience that we bring to the table in writing successful submissions. And, and I've learned so much in the years with DSI that goes into those filings that I think what we've done now is we've kind of build efficiencies into how we do things to make it more effective. But it all goes back to that very beginning where tell the story, does it tell the story? And what I learned from you early on, whether it's an early phase IND, does it meet the objective? Or are we talking about an NDA? Well, then these sections are more, more refined. There's a lot of effort put into it. And it was really helpful for me because our consultants that weren't in regulatory 
had that had that explained to them because they were contributing to that. And I think overall, you've given us that across the board, that culture of it's a it's a work in progress, make sure it tells the story, make sure scientifically it's sound. From that very small start with, with a handful of consultants to where we are today, we try to keep that culture moving and keep that going forward. I've learned a lot and I've, I've enjoyed it. And we've got quite a few projects that we could laugh about for sure. Yeah, that's certainly the case. Did you have any thoughts on your experience with the regulatory submissions in the last two years, Miranda? There was something that I wanted to have a podcast with you add on and potentially Brian is companies that are generic companies. It's my background came from generic companies with filings and submissions in that way. You know, the different types of submissions. I think that would be a great podcast that we could do together. Um, talk about all the different types of submissions. So on that note, yeah, that's talking about the uh, 2021 and beyond. So we'll be back um, at part at some point in season two. The last thing I wanted to touch on, a new member of our group here, Amber Sheriff, gave us a little insight in podcast episode number 16 about Brexit and about different types of um, submission mechanisms, whether it's a centralized, decentralized, national process, mutual recognition, et cetera. So let's listen to a little bit from uh, Amber from episode 16. So what is happening now, people who have filed in UK can no longer sell their products in EU because UK walked away from the European Union. So now they're setting up their own procedures and they are they are going through that, which still, you know, by the end of this year, they will be fully separated from European Union. Oh, no worries. But, you know, like I said, we're up against it here. I think Amber is going to have another episode with us uh, in the next coming year, and we'll have a lot of different uh, regulatory topics, especially hot topics as they come up. So changes in the winds, it's always happening and it's a requirement to move forward. You know, the greatest measure of intelligence is the ability to change, according to Albert Einstein. We look forward to season number two for CMC Live podcast. Please go back to listen to most, if not all of our episodes. Each each one has a unique flavor and also how, you know, is is culmination of years of experience. With that said, anything else, guys? No, I really appreciated the recap of the year. And it it really kind of reminds you of of how broad people's experiences are and how they complement each other. Thanks for listening. To read the full show notes for this episode, which include a summary, timestamps, and any links mentioned in this episode, please visit dsinformatics.com forward slash podcast. There you'll find the information from this episode and any past episodes. If you're enjoying this podcast, please leave us a rating and a review at ratethispodcast.com forward slash cmc live. We'll be sure to read these out on future episodes.